morning, and she just will not function until 11 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> you love to stay up at night and watch the news and, well, Jay Leno used to be, not, more, not Jay Leno anymore, but you love this kind of like staying up late, and this is where you got your double doses and you're ready to read and do a lot of work, and he is gone by 8.30, like he's out. <laughs> gone. Like nowhere to be found. So, so this kind of an irony of how we attract opposites is one of the best ways for you to kind of a move away from this comfort zone of isolation. I'm saying comfort zone because in God's economy, watch this. See, we discover that the way you move from isolation is by you reconnecting or getting in tune with God's purposes. And we said from week one that God's purposes is for men to have dominion in the context of submission. Now, please listen to me. Dominion in the context of submission. I'm just asking you right now. I'm just asking you to think and to process this concept. Who you marry will really determine a lot of how much submission you bring into the picture. Because for some of us, is we're so eager and we're so used to seek the Lord, to submit to the Lord, but then once marriage shows up, once the relationship gets into this oneness or intimacy, it becomes really a struggle to submit to the Lord. Because many times in the context of marriage, submission is translated as weakness and vulnerability. And that explains why so many people come from backgrounds of abuse. Comes from backgrounds where you have been literally taken advantage of. So the purposes of God are extremely important. Now, the Bible describes, and let me just give it to you right now. The Bible describes in Genesis 2.15 that God said... God said, before men sin, see, the sin, the rebellion is until chapter 3. This is chapter 2. So, a chapter prior to the rebellion, God said, it is when he took man and he put him in the garden. He put him to do what? He put him to work. And the Bible says, he's going to work and he's going to take care of the garden. This is why I'm asking you to do this on your second line, which is the concept of the stewardship. For you to move away from isolation, for you to move away from enlarging your kingdom versus God's kingdom, for you to move away from simply endorsing or indulging your personal agenda. And I am not against your agenda. I'm not against you. All that I'm saying is that we learn from week one and week two that you were created to plug into something bigger than you. That's all that I'm saying. You were created to have meaning, and meaning is only found in the context of relationships. So part of what I'm trying to get you to think for a second is Genesis 2.15 explains and gives us very clearly that before sin entered the world, man was commissioned to work. Now, this whole thing of work is extremely important, especially when a generation who has two extremes of work. Just look at me. There are two extremes of work, and I gave you the first one on week two. And I gave you a, I gave you a chart on the screen where it breaks down the major programs of health and aid from the government. And I explained to you that the article that I presented to you is what is called the tipping point, the tipping stage where we are at the verge of killing our country financially. Because we are a generation who we are so broken that we have people who make more money by not working. Right? That is wrong. And that's against the Bible. Period. I don't get how you see it. I mean, you can go back into history and you can look at empires in countries that they are not in existence anymore because they abuse that principle. Okay, can you say this? So on one side, you have people who refuse to work. On the other side, you have people who are workaholics and work and, and they go through this drive of work at the expense of a relationship with God, at the expense of family, at the expense of community. So what you're going to find in here is the Bible is describing that the way you're going to answer to this question that we're presenting and how is it and where does men find freedom from isolation is when men understand that work, first and foremost, is nothing else but you proclaiming through your actions that He is Lord and you are not. 
that he owns the garden and that you are the manager. See, the moment that you step away from community and you rule and you reign and you make decisions on your own, you're going to reflect this on how you work. You can either go into the place of laziness and nobody can get you off your couch. Are you following this? Or you can get to the point where you're going to behave. Listen, listen. You're going to behave as if, as if you own the garden. As if you are making a favor to everybody by showing up and bringing your brilliance. You and I are simply, according to Genesis 2.15, we are stewards of the garden. That's all that we do. And in the context of this stewardship is where God literally brings us away from isolation. Because this is what I told you for so many Sundays. And I'm going to say, my, I'm going to plead my case again. Nobody threatens your very own joy more than you. Nobody. Nobody is a threat to your fulfillment of life than she. So the moment that you start thinking she is, well, when I move away from this place, when I marry, when he is gone, or whatever, see, the moment you start putting that responsibility in somebody else is the moment that you are drawn back into isolation where now you decide what's right and what's wrong. So this is why I'm bringing you to this issue of stewardship. Stewardship is one of the best ways for you to understand that it's in the context, whatever God has placed in your hands, please look at me, whatever God has placed in your hands is never for you alone. Never, never, never. It's always for the good of others. So here's the second question, this is true. Second question is, how does man escape loneliness? You may find someone as productive and as driven in this whole deal, but how did you move someone away from loneliness? Now, in my mind, before I get you the, the Philip in, into this deal, in my mind, the biblical character that comes to me throughout the week, I just wrestled with this all over the week, was the character of David. It was in the context of isolation, in the context of loneliness, in the context of no accountability, where David walked into the roof of the palace and see this beautiful kind of a Dallas Cowboy cheerleader take a bath. She's taking a bath. She's naked. And she looked at the lady and said, I like that. Would you bring it over here? And you know the rest of the story. Her name is Bathsheba. And you know what happens at the end? See, that's what happens when you are in isolation. That's what happens when you decide what's true or what's wrong, what's right. That's what happens when you act. Listen, when David acted like he was the king of the kingdom. See, he was the manager of the kingdom. Who was the king? The owner of the kingdom. That's God. See, the moment you start thinking that you own the deal, bad things happen. And this is why, how do you escape this loneliness is... Not simply with a relationship, please listen, it's with a relationship that has a purpose. And I'm bringing this up because there are some people in this life that they cannot be by themselves. There are some singles that they are so, ah, that they've got to get married because time that the clock is ticking out. And now all I'm saying is this, I get you and I know you need and you deserve somebody, but here's the bottom line, do not compromise. I can argue the point that until you are content by yourself, you will never be content with anybody else. I, I can build that argument all day long. Because that's what we call codependency. Are you following me on this? That's when you walk into relationships and it can be, please listen, it can be obviously marriage, it can be grandparenting a child, it can be parenting a child, it can be you being the child of a parent, and this is where you're expecting for the other person to do. Please listen. To do what only Christ can do. And that's make you whole. Nobody can fulfill your... Okay. Not even you can fulfill your own life. You don't have that ability. How many times have you looked in the mirror and be frustrated and said, Oh, I knew it! I shouldn't say that. If I can just delete the text that I just sent. Ah, 
and you get upset with me because you go over that habit that you just cannot break it. See, all that I'm trying to tell you is this, guys. I'm just telling you, unless you find fulfillment in the God who is a trying God, who creates you for community with Him, and that community with Him is not is simply the result of how you relate to others. So, relationship with purpose. And then, the purpose, just in case that you know it, or that you need to be reminded, is the purpose to have dominion under submission. And this is why, listen, in the context of dominion <coughs> under submission, is where you are able to express who God is. So, as a single person, and again, we don't have a whole lot of singles in this room right now. But I know you deal with singles. Lots of them. But even if you are married, I want you to hear this. When you live a life on purpose in the context of relationships, and you are in charge because you have learned to submit, if you have the ability to be in control, even though relationships may not, relationships may not be as healthy and the best, instead of going so, oh, that I don't know what to do, and you panic because she hasn't returned the call, because he is not calling you again, or whatever the case may be, I want to listen to this. As long as you are under the submission of the Holy Spirit, and God remains the triune God, who is the owner of the garden, He's the owner of your heart. He's the owner of your feelings. He's the owner of your present. He's the owner of the future. When those things happen, what happens by default is that you become the expression of the presence of God. You become literally the aroma of Christ as Paul describes in Corinthians. So this morning, I want to take you to one more verse and we're going to close our time with our last question. This is what God said at the end of the conversation. God basically said, it is not good for men to be alone. Is that true? Come on, talk to me. Is that true? Is, is it really true that it's not good for us to be alone? Now, some of you are so ready to be alone. It's like, ah, when is this going to end? I hope that he doesn't call it him anymore. Like, you're going to be like, is it Christmas, Christmas again? We're going to go see them again? You know, those in-laws. Whatever the case may be, I want you to listen to this because this is where the Bible just takes this whole conversation. God said, again, this is chapter 2 before men ever seen it, and he said, it is not... Now watch, watch the pattern, because from chapter 1, verse 1, all the way through until chapter 2, verse 18, God had never said, it's not good. Everything God said is, He created, and it was good. He created, and it was good. He created, and it was good. He created man, and it was very good. Everything is good. Everything is good. Everything is good. Everything is good. And then you jump into verse 18, and God, for the first time, says, It's not good. It's not good. It's not good. So, so in my mind, this, I'm not saying this is what the Bible says, but in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, so this is the moment where where I'm seeing that for, for some unexplicable reason, I don't get it, don't ask me to get it, I've thought about it, I've prayed over this, and I just don't get it. God creates men. That even though this man has a perfect relationship with the owner, this man is functioning as the perfect steward, manager of the place. The Bible says that this man walked in the coolness of the day with God. He talked to God face to face. He related to God in a way that humanity has never done it up to Jesus Christ. And in this context of holiness and empowerment and beauty and perfection, for some crazy reason, which I don't get, this man was created for the need of relationship with another human being, even though he had a perfect relationship with God. I don't get it. Because in my mind, I'm thinking, if you give me God, that's all that I need. And God says, no, that's not true. That's not true. You can have me. We can have this perfect communion and relationship, and you still need a relationship with your neighbor. So the Bible says that it is not good for men to be alone. And the Bible says, I will make a suitable helper for him. So here is where you have to get the understanding of monogamy. It's just one wife. It's just one lady. This is important in our culture today. Extremely important. Number two, you need to understand that it seems to me that Adam found contentment.
commandment prior to me eating. I just said it, I'm going to say it again. You cannot place on your current or future or much less on your previous spouse something that belongs to the Lord. I believe that even if you are married to a non-believer, you can still find contentment. I believe even if you are married to a non-believer, you can succeed in marriage if you do the right thing. Why am I saying this? Because if you listen to my voice today, you listen to God's word, this is not, this is not, this is not a free ticket for you to get out of this place and say, I'm just going to have to divorce him because he's not a believer. No, that's not what we're talking about in here. All right? All that we're saying is that whatever decisions we have made, whether you are single or single again, whether you are married for a very long time, whether you are just entering marriage within the last few decades, whatever the case may be, here is the bottom line. Marriage was not created for you to be content. You decide to be content. You make the decision right now that in Jesus' fullness, in Jesus' empowerment, in Jesus' relationship, you find that because I can tell you right now, once you get to that place of full contentment, once you find that place of you feeling the, 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 the fullness of the presence of God, man, that makes relationships so much easier. Because I can tell you right now, there is nothing better than to marry a giver, than to marry a taker. And when you find contentment in relationship, this is the moment where you understand that you are here for others. The last thing that I want to say to you is this. Marriage is not about feeling in love. I'm over love. I love to love. Is that grammatically correct? I have no idea. But I'm all for love. Love is a beautiful thing. I love my kids. I love my wife. I love to love. But ultimately marriage, particularly marriage, it's not about you feeling in love. It's about building a life together. You make a commitment that regardless what the feelings are, that regardless if the feelings change, or let me put this way, when the feelings change, you will stay put. You will remain faithful. You will continue to press on towards the goal. Please look at me. The Bible describes that God created a social help because God knew that in the perfection of the relationship between him and Adam, the perfection of that relationship between creation and Adam, Adam and God, Adam and creation. God knew that Adam would never be able to fulfill ultimately the purpose of his life, which was dominion under submission, until he got a companion. I don't think you can actually fulfill that unless you find that companion. Now, quick parenthesis. If you have decided to stay single, that's a personal decision. As long as you do life right, and as long as you find the contentment in your singleness, you're good to go. You don't have to get married. But the reality is that most of us will eventually get married. The reality is that most of us eventually will become parents. The reality is that most of us were not designed to remain single. And it's in the context of these relationships that God is constantly empowering us to say, I want you to have dominion. Because as you have this dominion, because you have submitted to me, I want to ultimately show to Satan that even though he has more power than you, but he decided to live life above my dominion, or at least he thinks. I'm going to show him that with that lower being, which is humanity, that submits to me, I can do way more than with a powerful being that lives in rebellion. And this is why we are ambassadors of the gospel. This is why when we gather in this place and we proclaim the gospel, when we go abroad, when we go into, into evangelistic endeavors, 
all those things are important and good, but if I am not expressing this dominion or my daily walk with Christ and my daily walk with others, literally everything is in vain. Because it's in the context of this dominion as I live under submission. Would you please?